In this pre-lecture video, we're going to be discussing Newton's laws. Specifically, we'll be talking about Newton's first and second laws. So, Newton's first law is sometimes referred to as an object in motion stays in motion, an object at rest stays at rest. But more specifically, it is stated that if there is no net, where when we say net, we mean total, so no total external force that's acting on an object. So if there's no net external force on an object, then the object won't accelerate. And if an object is not accelerating, right, then we know that that means it has a constant velocity, where velocity is a vector. So even if something's moving in circular motion, remember that it is accelerating, even if its speed is constant. So the velocity is speed and direction, and that will stay constant unless there's a net external force acting. Now related to Newton's first law is the idea of mass and inertia. So we haven't yet talked about or defined mass in this course. So mass is a measure, so it's the measure of an object's linear, and I'll put linear because eventually we do rotation, so it's a measure of an object's linear inertia. And so what inertia is, is really just an object's desire to follow Newton's first law. It wants to keep a constant velocity. So inertia is the resistance to a change in velocity. So if you're driving in a car and you're going at a constant velocity and then you hit the brakes, your body wants to keep moving with that same velocity even though the car is stopping. And so you feel that inertia. You feel that your body wants to continue with that same velocity. So there's a lot of times where you can experience inertia, and mass is a measure of an object's inertia. Now, it's important to note, and we'll talk more about this during class, that inertia is not a force. Sometimes it can feel like a force, for example, with the car and you hit the brakes, you feel like you're getting forced forward, but you're not. That's just you obeying Newton's first law, so it is not in itself a force. So that's really all that we're going to talk about in terms of Newton's first law. And related to problem solving, Newton's second law is really where all of the important stuff happens. So Newton's second law is going to be used throughout this course in various problem solving methods. So we have to have a really good understanding of the basics. So in equation form, we can say that Newton's second law is that the sum of all forces and forces a vector is equal to the mass of an object times the acceleration of an object. So in words, the left-hand side of Newton's second law is that the sum of all individual forces acting on a mass. And this, in this case, would be a mass m. So this is a mass m, an object has a mass m, and this would be what we call the net force, which is specifically the sum of all the individual forces acting on that mass, only on that mass. And then that's going to then be equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration of that object. So acceleration of mass m. Now in problem solving, sometimes we have multiple dimensions, and so we can write this in components. And so we can write this out and use it in component form, where the net force, the sum of forces in the x direction, is equal to the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. 
and the sum of the forces in the y direction is equal to the mass times the acceleration in the y direction. So this is how it shows up in problem solving, as we'll see. Now we're talking about forces now, and so if we look at this equation for Newton's second law, we can see that the unit of force is going to be equal to mass times acceleration, so it would be equal to kilograms times meters per second squared, and that's what we define as a Newton, which is used as a capital N. And see how you can look at the equation in order to figure that out. Now, because this left-hand side is the sum of all individual forces acting on a mass, we need to talk about how to find those individual forces. You observe the net force by looking at the acceleration and multiplying by the mass, but the individual forces are sometimes hidden. For example, right now I'm sitting in my chair and I have a downward force of gravity on me and I have an upward force from the chair on me. So I have two individual forces acting on me and they add to zero, which is why my acceleration is zero. So what I'm going to do um, is give a list of all individual forces that we're going to use in this class. So we can say here a list of individual forces that we will use in UP1. Now there are more. Next semester you'll have magnetic forces and electric forces, but in this semester we will actually only have five different forces that you will use when you're trying to identify the net force on an object. So these individual forces, to make a list, the first one is going to be the force of gravity. Now note that force and acceleration are not the same thing. They're related through the mass. So force of gravity is not the same as acceleration due to gravity. Force of gravity is defined as also the weight of an object. So when we see weight, it's not the same as mass. Weight is going to be equal to a force. So the force of gravity is basically the force on something due to gravity. Um, and so if we take the positive J hat or Y component to be up, then we know that the force of gravity is going to be equal to negative mg j hat, meaning that the force of gravity is downward. Remember that g is always a positive number, so 9.8 meters per second squared, if we're near the surface of the Earth. So the force of gravity is downward, and it's equal to the mass times g. It is not the same as g because it's related to the mass. So something that's heavier has a larger force of gravity, which has a larger weight, as we'd expect. The other type of individual force, I'll just call a push or a pull. Now, this is really, you know, pretty obvious in a problem because the problem will say somebody's pushing on a box or they're pulling on a rope. And so really, this will be given or stated in the problem. The tension is another type of force. Now often if there's a rope or a wire then we're going to have a force of tension. So the tension is going to be a force from a wire or a rope, etc. And a main thing to think about when you imagine pulling on something with a rope, that the rope always pulls on an object. Tension always points away from the object along the rope. So tension always points away from the object along the rope, just as we'd expect. So when we do, work with what to call free body diagrams, which I'll talk about shortly, then just keep this rule in mind about tension. So for example, if I have, say, two blocks and they're connected by a rope, 
And then I'm pulling on the first block with some force F. This would be, say, a push or a pull, in this case, a pull. Then the tension in the rope, if I look at this object, the tension in the rope would point away from the object on along the rope. And then on the front box, if you imagine what that rope's doing, it's again acting along the rope, but in this case, again, away from the object, so it's pointing in a different direction for that particular object. The other thing for us to note with tension is because we're ignoring pulleys, then if we have a pulley and it's, say, on a table, and then there's a box on the table and then a rope hanging over the pulley and another box hanging from that. Well, we're ignoring for now the pulleys. When we get to rotation, this will change, but the tension is going to be equal in magnitude all points along a rope. So here we can say that the tension is equal at all points. For one rope, for one continuous rope, the tension, the magnitude of the tension is the same at all points. All right, so that's three of our things. We have force of gravity, push or pull, and tension. Another force, the fourth force, is friction. Now friction actually gets its own video, which you'll watch shortly. And so I won't talk much about friction now, but that's our fourth force that's allowed. And then the last one is what we call the normal force. So again, force of gravity, push or pull, tension, friction, and normal force. You can use these as a checklist as you do problems involving Newton's laws. The normal force, the normal comes from mathematical term for normal, meaning orthogonal, which means perpendicular. So this is a perpendicular force. This is a contact force. between two surfaces that is always perpendicular to the surfaces in contact. And we use N, I use little n, some people use capital N, um, and so these are all choices, capital N or F sub N, all of these can be used for normal force, and that's what we then will use when we're drawing diagrams. Now, a couple notes about the normal force. One of them is that because it's perpendicular to the surface, then we can look to see what would happen, for example, if we have a block on a ramp. A block on a ramp, then the force of gravity, say, would point straight down towards the center of the Earth but the normal force is gonna be perpendicular to the surfaces in contact. And so the normal force points perpendicular to the ramp. And then the scale, the other thing that shows up in problem solving um, problems is going to be that a scale, if you have a problem saying what does the scale read, a scale reads what you feel pushing up on you. So a scale reads the normal force. So a scale reads the contact force between two surfaces. So if you push harder, uh, if I had a scale on this table and I push harder down on it, then it's going to read more than my weight. So it's, a scale will read the normal force. So keep that in mind as you go through problems as well. That concludes our introduction to Newton's first and second laws. Go ahead and pause the video, try to answer these self-check questions, and then check your answers with the answers that will be displayed at the end of this video. As always, let me know if you have any questions at all.